All right. Let's get started, everyone. And I'd like to thank you. My name is Arch Devadas with ACGI Software. Uh, we are hosting the Knowledge Builder webinar series. And if you've sat through uh, some of them throughout the year, you notice that we've tried to bring together some great subject matter experts to present some uh, compelling topics. Uh, the topic today or the title of this webinar is Avoiding the Common Pitfalls of a System Implementation. So if you're here and you've read that title, it's pretty self-explanatory. But being in the business of implementing software and systems and technology, whether you are dealing with an, a database system, an association management system, a CRM, a learning management system, a community system, um, gosh, a website, what have you. There's so much technology out there today that it becomes a really important responsibility to have oversight on the project. And today, uh, we bring to you some experts, Doug Brown with Catalyst Fire and Michael Hain with ACGI Software. I'm going to get back to them in just a moment, but many of you are also here today um, to earn a CAE. What I wanted to let you know is ASAE, the American Society of Association Executives, has approved ACGI to provide uh, content to you and to provide some programming that will earn a CAE. What I'd like to let you know is at the end of this webinar today, and I will remind you again because I know some people are just jumping in, but um, I will remind you that you need to answer a polling question that just basically confirms you are you have participated for the duration of today's webinar. It's a simple yes or no question. Please do not miss that because we will have to track that to be able to uh, confirm that you did uh, sit for today's webinar. The other thing is just know that we are not sending out any type of certificates. ACGI will keep this on record. However, if you need to have any type of verification, you can contact us, and that's not a problem at all. Uh, just a little bit about our host, the host today, which is ACGI Software. We're located here in Columbia, Maryland. We are developers of two systems, Association Anywhere Association Management Software System and Certelligence, a credentialing management software system. We work with professional societies, trade associations, credentialing organizations, association management companies that work with a portfolio of different organizations. So just a little bit of housekeeping again, and I'll just repeat myself in case some of you are just joining us. This uh, today's education webinar will earn you a CAE credit. Again, you must answer at the conclusion of this webinar today a polling question just to confirm that you have sat for the full duration of the webinar. Um, very simple. And again, I'll come back and remind you of that. If you have any questions, just a little bit more housekeeping here, on the GoToWebinar console, if any of you have that pulled up, you'll notice to the right, kind of towards the bottom there, there's a section called Questions. If you expand that, that little feature in the console, you'll be able to ask us questions in real time. We may not be able to answer them directly, but we will try to get to those questions at the conclusion of the webinar. Um, and if we have some time, uh, try to answer as many questions as we can. If not, I promise you we will get back to you uh, to, to answer some of those questions. And lastly, if you have any problems with um, just accessing this webinar today, it looks like all of you are in and running smoothly. But if you have any problems, please send us an email at info at acgisoftware.com. We will try to help you out as the best we can. So let me introduce again our presenters today uh, for today's webinar. Doug Brown is the president of Catalyst Fire. Doug is the co-founder or a founder, excuse me, of Catalyst Fire, a consultant firm located in uh, Chicago. And they're focused on partnering with associations and credentialing bodies to facilitate IT strategic decisions and implement technology projects. Catalyst Fire has been a longtime partner of ACGI software. They've actually participated at our, at our users conference and have presented uh, with us. So we are happy to welcome Doug. Doug, you're with us? Hi, Arch. Yep, thanks for All including right. me with us. Absolutely, and uh, thanks for that sound check. <laughs> and, and then I'd like to introduce Michael, our own Michael Hain. He's the Vice President of Professional Services for ACGI. Michael leads end-to-end uh, -end software delivery for ACGI software and its customers uh, from initial analysis, the scope of work, to project implementation and execution. He works with his team and ACGI staff and customers at all levels just to evaluate, plan, implement changes in systems and processes 
And Michael is not only an employee of ACGI, he actually was once a customer um, running an association management company. So he comes to us, both of these gentlemen come with us with lots of great experience, and we are happy to have you both here today. Um, so before we actually get into the presentation, Michael, I'm going to hand over the controls to you, but at the same time, would you like to uh, start off with anything, a polling question or anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I just first of all want to thank everybody for attending and welcome. Um, we are really excited, Doug and I, to uh, present this information to you guys. Um, I think you're going to get um, an interesting viewpoint on system and implementations and pitfalls, given the fact that uh, Doug has worked for a uh, technology vendor, and he's a consultant now to many associations and credentialing bodies. As Arj alluded to, my background is actually uh, working with associations and credentialing organizations for um, uh, 10 years, and then another five years working at ACGI to help them do system implementations better. Um, and Doug and I have seen a lot, and I'm sure he, he can expand a little bit more on his background, but we, we just wanted to have a conversation with all of you about some of the common pitfalls that we've seen. Um, in my experience, I've deployed and helped deploy as a client uh, three AMSs, two LMSs, up to five websites and numerous backend systems, um, and uh, I, I drew on a lot of that experience uh, to kind of put my side together, and then I'll, I'll let Doug expand a little bit on his background and what he's seen in terms of his system experience, but we work together, too, in, in this latest uh, position with me at ACGI and Doug at Catalyst Fire um, helping our clients, and so we thought this is really pertinent information. If you are considering in the throes of thinking about your next system implementation, whatever that system is, we, ho we hope you've got some good learnings that will come from this. So, um, Doug, you want to say anything before I move into the first poll? Uh, sure. Just to give a little background, I actually have been doing system implementation since the late 80s, to believe that. Um, I worked in healthcare IT for quite some time, and then since the early 2000s, I've been working with associations and doing implementations there. So uh, I've worked with a number of different association management systems, uh, learning management systems, uh, website content management systems, and various others. So I think... Uh, a lot of background on uh, on our topic today. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. So we were hoping uh, just that everyone that's on the call might be able to participate in our first poll and kind of give Doug and I some context about where you might be in the uh, uh, in your aspects of system and implementation. Are you currently implementing any new systems, or are you considering a new system implementation, whether that's an AMS or a credentialing management system or an LMS or website? Um, are you resting? I almost was tempted to put recovering after recent system implementation, or are you in some other aspect? So please go ahead and, and toggle or, or mark which one is, is best suited to you, and, and we'll see where, where everybody is. Arj, whenever you're ready we'll give you about, to move on from that. Yep. Okay, and we'll give you about maybe 30 more seconds. So if everyone just take a few okay. seconds just to answer this poll the best you can, or not, it is optional. But we will come back and uh, give you some results. Yeah, there is extra credit, but that's mainly Doug and I will appreciate you answered it. No, no, nothing else tangible. But. I'll tell you one thing, Michael. I've never selected option three. There's never a <laughs> time for resting. <laughs> yeah, I, I think one of the biggest changes. Go ahead. All right. I think one of the biggest changes down. I've seen. One of the biggest changes I've seen in 15 years in the business is, yeah, it is consistent and constant change. Yep. All right. There we go. So, yeah, great mix. 38% uh, of you are right in the middle of an implementation. A quarter of you are actually resting after a system implementation. Um, you know, I know that happens, right? You, you bite off something, you, you get it accomplished, and before you move on to the next one, you need some uh, recovery time. And... Um, you know, 13 of you are implementing right now. So we've got a good mixture. Um, and like I said, I think what Doug and I will be able to provide you today, whatever you're considering implementing, wherever you are in that implementation life cycle, and it is never ending. Um, I often say that when I first got into this business, it was, hey, put the website up and hopefully we won't touch it again for another 10 years or deploy an AMS and hopefully we never have to really invest or do anything more with that. Now that we've embraced that we really are digital businesses, it is a constant, never-ending stream of cycling through our technology. So um, when we talk today, hopefully this will be a benefit to you, you know, as you move forward with different systems that you're looking at. 
Um, D Doug and I broke this up into kind of four steps that we see and tried to come up with some macro takeaway points. Uh, we wanted to look at, you know, where are the pitfalls when you're preparing and planning for an implementation? We also kind of wanted to talk about what those pitfalls were when you're partnering with another company um, and, and working with them to get an implementation up. And then at what we call that the work site, when you're in the throes of the implementation, what are some of the pitfalls? And then increasingly, the implementation, what is the end of it? How does that define? And, and we called that go live and beyond and, and some of the pitfalls that occur with that. So the way Doug and I set this up is it will be conversational style. We're each going to talk a little bit about a point that, that we feel pretty strongly about and give you a couple examples and some ways that we've seen that, to deal with those that are, that are successful. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll move through this, and then at the end, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you've got. So let's start with the preparing and planning. One of the aspects that always jumps out at me, I get asked a lot by um, potential customers or clients that we're talking to, and, and they say, hey, what, what, what's one of the number one challenges that you see in a system implementation? And, and I always say, you know, never underestimate tradition. Um, it is really, really easy uh, to say we're going to put a new system in and what we're hoping to achieve, whatever that system is, is best practices, new ways of doing things, new ways of, of, of processing things. However, um, that desire to do something new can often be subsumed during the implementation by our staff and our constituents that want things to work the way that they're familiar with and that they're comfortable with. Um, in fact, the first AMS that I ever deployed over 15 years ago, we had this happen, where as executive leadership, we wanted to bring in a system to replace a homegrown system. We wanted that system to give us some new ways of doing things to get more efficient. And then we kind of stepped out of the mix of that as executive leadership and let the staff kind of work with the vendor to dictate how the system should be configured and operated. And what happened is at the end of it, what we realized is our staff basically had rebuilt the previous system that they were comfortable with in the new system, which worked against what our strategic objectives were. So I always um, ask uh, our clients when we get engaged, what are you hoping to achieve? And if best practices, operational efficiencies are there, then I say, well, then we're going to have to challenge a lot of, well, that is the way we've always done it, and we're going to need executive leadership and involvement to make sure that we stay on the course. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, it needs to be dictated and only can operate one way. But I think it really is important to challenge if you're going to do something and it's going to replicate what you had before, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? So being conscious of that is really important. Doug, anything you want to add on that bullet point? Yeah, I think it's a, a real key point and something that I like to emphasize throughout a project. So I typically have the top three or four goals of the project that we all agreed upon before starting, and I have that handy. And I will reiterate those at almost every project management meeting so that people are still on target with those goals and don't vary from them. So I think it's re really important to, to have those goals, know why you were investing in this new system you're implementing, why you're putting all this time and effort into it, and then keep going back to that in order to reemphasize. Fantastic. Um, Doug, you want to talk about risk mitigation? Sure. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, as a former PMP, I didn't keep up my licensure, but um, one of the key things that you learn as a project manager is to be sure that you have identified risks in advance. You have to plan and you have to think about the, the potential risks before they arise. You have to have a plan of action for what is likely to occur um, and be able to invoke those different uh, mitigation actions as needed. So um, I really recommend that you have a risk register for any substantial project. Um, types of risks I'm talking about are things like, uh, let's say a key person on the project leaves, how are you going to deal with that? Um, if one of your vendors has resource constraints, how are you going to deal with that? New scope gets introduced, or maybe there was a scope misunderstanding well, there has to be some mechanism that you have in place to deal with that. Um, and then always there are these unforeseen technical challenges that will come into play that cause delays or, or cause a, a portion of the project to have to be rethought. And uh, you, you just want to have a plan in advance of how you're going to deal with these types of situations that you, you just know are going to occur during a technical implementation. Um, in this risk register, you also want to know who is responsible and how you're going to resolve these, these risks. So typically, um, there might be somebody who's a key contact at the vendor 
or a key technical resource who's the technical lead on the project uh, or a project manager or the uh, stakeholder at the business, but somebody needs to be the right person who's going to deal with uh, situations like a key person leaves. Um, and then the way I look at this too is it's an opportunity for you to interact with the executive sponsor of your project. So any good project has an executive sponsor, you put together a project charter, and you know what we just talked about previously, you know the goals and why you're doing the project. Um, but then this lets that executive sponsor know that you've got your act together and you know what the risks are and you have a plan of attack should any of these things occur. So that's what I have there, Michael. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback on that. And I, one of the things that I recommend to our customers, system implementations um, do have a lot of moving pieces. And many of us, when we're um, replacing these systems, we actually start doing more than just the system itself. Maybe we're doing some new integrations. Maybe we're bringing multiple systems up online at the same time. There's a lot of moving components. So one of the things that I highly recommend right at the very beginning um, so that it's out, it's healthy, it's discussed is what's our contingency plan? What happens if we um, aren't able to hit a go live date because another uh, third system that is part of this process isn't going to be ready on time? Um, I love Doug's observation. What if a key person leaves? How would we handle that? Um, talking about those crises ahead of time and having a contingency plan really helps take the emotion out when those moments happen. Um, you know what your, your, your backup plan is, you know how to deal with it, and you're both on that together. Um, I also, to tie back to what Doug said about never underestimating tradition and having that list of what is it we're really trying to achieve, sometimes what's important in contingency planning is re doing a hierarchy. What are the most critical things that we need to happen? Because sometimes during the implementation, you'll find you'll start to get to a trade-off. Well, we can't get all of this done in the time frame we needed, but what are the most absolute critical items that need to get done in that time frame? And um, sometimes you need to focus on those and put some other things on the back burner until those are completed in order to have it happen. So, um, like I said, I highly recommend having that conversation up front um, when when it's easy to do so because it, it, it's not happened yet. So, um, moving on and to the next point, I, I think another good recommendation that both of us have is being really careful about assumptions. We, we, we've all, you know, in our business careers heard about, you know, issues with assumptions and assuming. And the issue that we see in system and implementations of assumptions is for many of us, a lot of our staff have been with us for a long period of time, which means that they may not have been exposed to a variety of different systems. Um, a new LMS, they're automatically going to think, well, it operates just the way the old LMS did. Um, and so, you know, it, they may have exposure, possibly if they came from someplace else to some other ways of doing things, but sometimes I've seen an inherent assuming that goes on by staff, well, if this is the way the old system worked, then the new system will automatically do that. And the analogy I always give is, I, I remember the, the, the first truck I ever bought, I was so excited to get it, and I looked at the list of features, and I got it all, and it was wonderful, and I drove it around here in Colorado for two weeks, and then I took it out two weeks later for the first time on the highway, and I went to put cruise control on. And guess what? There was no cruise control. And it had never occurred to me to think about the cruise control. I just assumed that every car these days comes with cruise control. Um, and so one of the things that we try to talk about, um, Doug referred to the project charter document that we recommend is how do we tell our clients not only what are you getting, but what aren't you getting? What, what, what isn't there? And again, when this can be done up front and there can be a dialogue, a lot of times you can accomplish things that you have done in previous systems, but you can't automatically assume the way you did it in your previous system is the way your new system will do it. So trying to overcome those assumptions and really document that and make sure that all stakeholders are on the same page is really, really important. It takes a lot of dialogue and discussion. Doug, do you have stuff to add to that? Um, I think I think a key point is to uh, make sure that you don't gold plate and to make sure that as you're going through the project that you're uh, sticking to what you uh, agreed upon and you don't assume that it's going to um, have that gold plating. So there's a lot of communication that has to occur with the customer and with the vendors to make sure everybody is um, thinking the same thing when you say you're going to complete a particular task in the project. Um, because every gold plating adds up and it, and it turns into real issues with budget and timing. So that's one thing I wanted to add. Excellent. Thanks, Doug. All right. Um, let's move into the next part of the life cycle. Arj, if we can move to the next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about partnering. 
Um, partnering to me is one of those words. If, you, if you've been around for a while, you remember when partnership and partnering was on that list of corporate buzzwords we probably shouldn't use anymore because it had been so overused that it become meaningless. And I often like to go back to the standard definition of partnership is one associated with another, especially in action. So two parties that are associated with each other moving forward in action. And your vendors of all your products do want to be good partners, especially if you're picking good vendors and people that are committed to this industry and to the association and credentialing space and that are passionate about it. That's something that they bring. Their, their passion for your business is as powerful probably as your passion for it. Um, you know, I know we talk a lot here about we want to enable our customers to be able to be successful in what they do for their constituents. But good partnership means that we have to find ways to communicate to, with each other, respect one another, and work together. And that's really easy to say, but it can be difficult to do. So, you know, I do encourage, get, take some time to get to know each other as corporate entities, not just as individuals. Um, you know, what, what are the values of that organization? What are your values? How do those align together? What are the most important things to you as an organization? If your organization, is, you know, um, really is hierarchical and, and it's a command and control organization, how does that fit with the vendor that you're going to work? What are their values around that? If it's more open communication, how do you work on that? But partnerships take work. And one of the things, going back to assumptions, I think, is sometimes we can assume that our partner on the other side operates exactly the way we do. And I think establishing up front, what are the rules of the road in terms of communication, responsiveness, working together, meeting, those are really, really important to make that relationship work. Because it is going to be a relationship. Depending on the system that you're deploying, boy, you two may be working cheek by jowl for a long period of time. And many of us don't want to just buy systems or license systems that we toss out the window the next year. We're make, looking at this as a long-term investment. Likewise, your vendor partners really are looking at you as a lifetime customer, and that's what they're hoping to achieve. So working on that partnership is critical. Doug, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, this one really speaks to me uh, being a, a partner with my customers who work with the ACGI system and also work with Catalyst Fire. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that our really good partner um, customers, they actually involve us in, in key decisions. So when they're planning next year's budget, they'll reach out to Catalyst Fire and say, hey, um, we have these three projects that we think you'll get involved with, and we want to know what's a reasonable amount of money to, to um, set aside for these projects. And then that way they're not surprising us during the year with projects that we didn't know about, and they're actually taking advantage of our expertise to help them come up with, with budgets that make sense, and they won't be surprised when, when we actually go forward with those projects. Um, the other thing is, I would say just make sure that you say it out loud. So tell everyone in your project, everyone who's involved, what their ex what your expectations are for their participation. So partnering really means, and I guess I keep <laughs> I keep uh, harping on communication, but what it really means is that you really know what each piece uh, or what each stakeholder in the project is contributing and what the expectations are. Who is responsible for getting this project done and where they're lending their expertise. And speaking of expertise, I think it's important also to uh, make sure that you do rely on the, the expertise and default to the expertise of those people who are involved. So if you've hired a web design team and they've come up with a UI or a user experience that really makes sense, um, be inclined to heed their advice about some of the decisions you're making as you're doing that. Um, don't think that you're a better web designer than professionals who are doing that. But I would really encourage that as you have vendors who are experts in certain areas, and that's why they're part of the project, um, that you default to their wisdom on, on certain decisions that happen throughout the project. That's what I had there. Excellent. Well, I think you mentioned communication, and Doug, I know that this whole issue of communication is key, is, is really important to you. You want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think um, really all the successful projects I've been on had consistent and clear communications amongst everybody who's involved. Um, one of the things that I, I've found really works well is to make sure that everybody on the team, from whatever vendor, whichever stakeholder, whether they're an executive or someone who's not an executive, um, being able to raise the red flag about anything to say, I think there's a problem here, and and be encouraged to let us know about that. 
so that we can address that as soon as we hear about it and not wait until someone's kind of afraid to say that there's a problem or that they're not going to get something done and then then it becomes too late to address it. So I think it's better to have an encouragement of that and uh, foster that throughout the project. Um, what you really want to have is a communication plan throughout the project. Um, this is things like when are you going to notify staff about the impacts that are going to happen to them as they implement the system? How are you going to start preparing your customers, your members, your candidates with um, what changes that they should be anticipating as the project is implemented? Um, so in order to do that, really, you should have a RACI chart, which lets you know who's responsible and who's being communicated to for each of the different topic areas. And then have many, many touch points with your stakeholders to let people know what's going on. People who are in the dark and don't know if progress is being made, they get antsy and they, they just get into a situation where they imagine things are not going right. So it's much better to be continuously giving uh, project updates and letting people know where things stand, whether it's good or bad news. Um, and then when you are communicating, make sure you know your audience. So if you're talking to members, you know what that audience needs to hear. If you're talking to staff, you know what they need to hear. And let, let them know that you understand their perspective and then give them uh, good communications that, that are about the project and how it will impact them. How about you, Michael? I, I love the idea of the communication plan, and I think this ties back to effective partnership. Again, some organizations do much better using email or um, online ticketing type of systems to share information and collaborate that way. Other organizations do a lot better with more uh, phone calling, more meeting time. Um, you know, some do better with more FaceTime. I think establishing up front how you want to have that communication and having that schedule is really, really important, as well as the way you want to communicate. Um, and, and I can't emphasize enough what, what Doug said about anybody should have the right to raise the red flag. In fact, I often say to our folks here, when it comes to news, it may be, let's say, bad news. Um, how do we deal with that? And, uh, you know, I think you deal with it directly, you deal with it quickly, and you deal with it unemotionally. If you've got a good partnership and a good communication plan, it should feel like it's a we, both organizations working through challenges and problems together as, as they become encountered. So um, I, I, I strongly agree. Good partnerships don't happen by chance. That requires good communication, and that needs to be organized and planned up front. Um, so we're going to move on to our next point, but before we do that, Arch, could we have our second poll? We wanted to find out kind of at the midpoint here, um, just kind of how you guys feel. I'm sorry, go ahead, Arch. No, I was just going to say, sure, we can uh, launch it right now. Great. So one of the questions we wanted to ask is, Doug and I were just kind of curious as to when it comes to a system implementation, what, what, for lack of a better term, keeps you up at night? What's your primary fear or, or, or worry or anxiety um, when you're putting a new system in place? Is it going over budget, um, having to go back to the board and ask for more money and, 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 and do that? Is it not meeting a deadline? Is it, you know, we need to go live by a certain point and I'm worried that we're not going to do it? Um, is it wearing out? your own staff. Um, you know, what I always say about system deployments, it's not like anybody got extra time carved out. This is an addition to the day job. And I know that can be taxing, especially if you're the project coordinator on your side. Um, or are you more concerned about disappointing your constituents, whether that's your members, your certificates, your board of directors, um, that, you know, whatever you roll out or come out with isn't going to measure up to what they were hoping for? Um, or is it no concerns? Do you, do, do you feel pretty good when you go into this? So, Please take a 30 seconds here and, and, and chime in. Let us know what you think would be your number one or, or no concern at all when it comes to a system implementation. We'll give everybody a few minutes and then Arj will turn that over to us when we got some results. I think I've seen each one of these in action, Doug. Yeah, there, there are certainly uh, all of those things are, are what we want to avoid, but inevitably you're going to have to deal with these situations. Yep. Hopefully not the fourth one. Yeah. 
um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's really, did, did we get something out there that stood the test of time and that people were excited about? Yep. All right, Arj, we're ready? All right, here we go. Ah, well, this is an interesting split. So, yeah, half of the group is worried about going over budget. Half's worried about not meeting deadline. I mean, at the end of the day, Doug will tell you, you had a PMP. Definition of project success is usually on time, on budget, right? 13% um, worried about wearing out your staff, so not too many, but I would encourage all of you, uh, when you go into a system and an implementation, take some time to socialize that with the people that are going to have to test it, work with it, use it. Um, that, that can be a, a real challenge if, if you're not aligned on that. And then half of you are worried about disappointing constituents, and I think that's, that's, that's important. Like we said, at the end of the day, that's really where the rubber meets the road. So, um, you know, like hopefully some of the things we're sharing will, will help alleviate some of those concerns. I often say, you know, our job is to help you guys sleep well at night, and so knowing how um, what keeps you up helps us do our job better. Um, Arj, can we move on to the next slide? And I think, Doug, you're going to talk a little bit about some of the pitfalls that we see when we're actually in the implementation, starting with kind of implementing checkpoints as a way to deal with that. Right. So this section was about really when the rubber hits the road and now you're in the midst of your project. And uh, what are some of the things that we've seen that have been effective tools for you um, to have a smooth implementation? So as a project manager myself, um, and as being on a core team for many different implementation projects, I find that you're you're really in the, in the position of a coach or maybe, you know, like a conductor, uh, a music conductor, or just a, a facilitator of some sort. So as a project manager, you have to know all aspects of what's going on with the project. You have to be able to speak to the different communities, whether they're technical or business. Um, and then you must have a high-level project plan as well as a detailed project plan that you're working from. Um, and then for this first bullet point, really, what I'm saying is that as part of that project plan, be sure you have checkpoints. So you want to know that you're on target. You have to know whether you're behind uh, running into situations, uh, basically whether the project is, is green, yellow, or red. And... Uh, with a series of checkpoints that you've agreed upon with the technical team as well as the business team throughout the project, you can you can say, well, did you finish writing your SOPs? Did you complete your testing? Did you get fully trained on the system? Um, was the uh, form validations put in place on this particular form? So different things that might be checkpoints that are really critical to the project. You should know when you expect to have those completed and then make sure that you're checking and, and, and ensuring that they are completed. So I say early and often, which since I'm from Chicago, that's kind of a saying, but it, that has more to do with voting. <laughs> but early and often <laughs> is what you want to do with checkpoints. Um, make sure that you you don't assume, well, the first couple of months, we don't really have to check in too much because nothing's happening. It, that's, a, that's a bad situation. There should be something happening from the get-go, and it shouldn't be a ramping up at the end in order to barely get across the finish line. Uh, so make sure you have these checkpoints throughout and make sure they're tangible is the other point here. So you want to be able to see that pro progress. You want to be able to see that uh, somebody created the database. You want to be able to see that that table exists and that uh, the, the logic is put in place for the store procedure that runs in order to generate the report. Um, you want to see that they actually have written three of the 17 SOPs and they're moving along and, and making progress. So these checkpoints need to be tangible so that you can verify that they're good. Did you have anything on checkpoints, Michael? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan with those checkpoints of using scorecards and using mechanisms. I often say, um, let's let the data be the bad guy. Um, if up front at the very beginning of the project, to Doug's point, if you say, hey, we want to touch base weekly and we want to have an executive team meeting once a month to look at our progress, well, those meetings are a lot more constructive if you've got scorecards to look at with those meetings and you can do all kinds of different approaches on that. Maybe part of it is your timeline. How much work did we expect to have done by this point? Are we ahead, behind, kind of in the range that we wanted to be? Um, has there been scope increase? Have we added new functionality and things in and still expect to deliver the entire project within the original time frame that we wanted? 
Um, we use scorecards for things like data conversion of some of the key information, right? Because, you know, is, is the data conversion going well or are we running into challenges? And, and to Doug's point, doing some of that heavy lift way early in the process so that if there's going to be any problems, we know about it. But scorecards are a really good way, again, to, to, to make sure there's good communication um, and that there's effective discussion about really reality checks. Um, you know, I often equate system implementation to building a house or doing a kitchen renovation. If you want your kitchen renovated and you want it done by Thanksgiving, I think we'd all feel a little bit better if that was done a week ahead of time at a minimum. You don't really want to be the night on night before Thanksgiving still installing stuff, putting paint up and hoping it all comes together. So, you know, having those checkpoints and having a scorecard, I think, is really, really critical um, to making those kind of interactions between each other successful and knowing that you're on the same measurement of success of what you want to do. Um, I think along those lines is the next point. Any system that you implement, you're going to get some curveballs. There's going to be something that comes up that you weren't expecting from either side. And I'm a big fan when those challenges come up, and this relates back to doing that uh, uh, contingency planning and, and risk mitigation that Doug was talking about earlier, it, when those challenges do occur, deal with them quickly and directly. Um, even the best partnerships are going to face those challenges, and the best way to handle challenges when they come up is an open discussion immediately and then try to figure out and manage solutions together. And if you've followed Doug's advice about doing some contingency planning, hopefully you just dust off the contingency plan and you start to talk about it. Um, really planning for that stuff in advance helps, but you may also get hit with some stuff that you weren't planning on. And really at that point, if you've got a good partnership, you've had good communication, um, you've been doing your checkpoints and staying in touch with one another, you know when those curveballs come up, what, what are our options at this point? Can we delay some functionality in the system in order to get it delivered in the time we were hoping for? Can we delay the go live itself just to get more functionality within that? Or what are we going to do so that we can really make sure that we're a success? Um, you know, a lot of those points. And, and, you know, you want to build in a good escalation process. I'm a big fan that your project management teams are probably going to be meeting weekly, maybe every other week, depending on what you're doing. But bring your executive leadership together at least once a month, if nothing else, by sending a report out every month. How are we doing? Are we on track or whatever? And if there is a problem, then don't have escalation be a bad thing. It shouldn't be a negative where we're going to escalate it. It should be, okay, we need to get our leadership together so we can talk through possible options and solutions because we're in this together. We're working for a common goal. Doug, anything you want to add about dealing with challenges? I think that's a great point with escalation and, and that it shouldn't be a, uh, I really don't want to ever do this. It should be one of your tools that you utilize at the right moments in time. And I think, uh, the executives actually uh, respect that and, and they feel that they're able to contribute at that, at that uh, point when you really need them to be involved. Fantastic. Doug, you want to talk a little bit, speak of high risk, about integrations? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yeah, we, we tend to work with a lot of integrations. Um, no uh, AMS does everything. No content management system does everything. So, there's a whole bunch of vendor products that are out there that um, provide a very specialized piece of functionality that needs to be integrated back to your other system. And the reason that I bring this up is because now you're involving even another vendor in your project. Typically, the integrations are pieces that aren't, um, I guess, the core of your project, but they're more of a very important pieces that talk to other components that are outside of your project. And sometimes they get um, kind of pushed to the side. Sometimes people think that they should do them last. Um, but to me, they're such a, such a challenge because uh, now you have vendors who speak different languages. Um, one vendor will have terminology that the other has no idea what it is. And that's okay because then you can get over, um, over those bumps by ex explaining what they are. The worst ones are the vendors that use the same word for, for two different meanings. So, for instance, people talk about a candidate, and that might mean something to one vendor versus another. People talk about an application, where we might call it a submittal, and there's challenges with what that even means. And definitely with the concept of workflow, people have totally different ideas of what that means. So, having a common lexicon, a common language between all of the people involved is, is critical to making sure that you really understood each other and you're getting things done. We have this 
idea that we call a definition of done. And in order to, to actually say that a particular task is done, we define what that means. And that way, everybody who's participating can agree upon what it means to have completed a particular task. Um, the other thing related to this is making sure you have really detailed testing plans for integrations. It's, it's fairly easy to test a feature that's within your system. You know, you can log in, you can get to the form, you can interact with it, you can try to break it, and then you can say, hey, it's working. But with integrations, it's a lot more challenging. You don't know exactly what things are doing behind the scenes. You have to make sure that you understand um, both sides of the equation, the initiating system as well as the receiving system for any of these integration points. Um, and then you really have to think through all the scenarios. We, we call it a happy path scenario, which is kind of your most expected process that you're going to go through for uh, that involves an integration. But then you have to deal with things like, well, I, I think of it as like the evil end user um, who's going to do something that was just totally unexpected. Um, or things that are technical glitches where one system was down, one system uh, didn't expect data that was sent across. Uh, a whole bunch of different scenarios you have to really think through, have detailed testing plans, and then exercise those plans so that you're sure that the integrations are solid. Michael? Yeah, I, I, I can't emphasize the integration component enough. Um, you know, it is going back to our house analogy, like asking your contractor to work with maybe appliances or windows or something that they've not encountered before, or maybe they have, and, and but they've encountered it differently. They can give you the best guess they've got based on it, but the best way to deal with this, put integrations up front, at least look at them and have a plan. Um, you know, make a, don't make assumptions that something will be straightforward. Start talking about it because if it's going to be more complicated than you thought, you don't want to find out about that at the 11th hour, um, assuming that it was going to be pretty straightforward and then find found out it was more complicated. And, you know, be creative. Rely on your partners. Both, you know, at this point now, it's going to be you as a client, your technology vendor, and then this third party that you've got. They may You may have to get creative about how you make that integration actually work or, 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 or operate. So um, my biggest piece of advice on integrations, have that as one of the primary things to at least do an analysis. What are we planning on doing and do we know it'll work up front? If you decide it is pretty easy and you confirm that, and it can go to the back of the line of the project, fantastic. But don't wait and assume on that. All right, so Arj, if we can go to the next slide. We've got you through implementation, and now you're going live. <laughs> and, and I think Doug and I have a, a couple little thoughts about what that go live process really feels like. So, Doug, you, you want to kick it off? Yeah, sure. Um, back in high school, actually, <laughs> I, um, I was on sports teams. And it was quite a thrill to, you know, have a victory after you spent uh, a week on the football field preparing and then beating your crosstown rival. Um, but I think maybe some of the best experiences I had were I was in the high school musical and we would spend months preparing and then we'd um, actually perform the entire musical in front of an audience. And after you complete that and you know that you did a fantastic job, that's a wonderful feeling. And, and that's what we would like to have with pretty much every system implementation. So I always kind of relate it back to my, my theater in high school. Um, so to me, Go Live is your premiere, which is, this is essentially the performance that you've worked so hard to implement. You've, you've been well coordinated. Um, you know all of the steps you're going to go through. You have a team that you have uh, over time really become a, a, a great working team together and then um, hopefully you're very prepared with your go live preparation. So you have things like checklists that you're going to go through. You have anticipated timings for when you think each piece of the go live is going to complete. Um, and then you have a mechanism in place for frequent reporting. So you might say, well, the, the data conversion is going to take one day. Well, you want to be able to report back throughout that day and say, um, you know, we had a problem with the membership data, so that might put us back an hour or um, the CRM data came in so quickly that I think we're going to be a little bit ahead. But at least people should know about progress, especially this is very high anxiety during the go live, and you want to be sure that everyone's having those communications once again. Um, and, and really there is a responsibility to be reporting out on progress as you're doing your go live. 
Um, and, and kind of back to that same issue before, because I've seen it at organizations, you want to encourage people to report the bad news. So if the bad news occurs, and then maybe somebody thinks, well, maybe I can make it up um, in the next step of the, of the go-live process, and then I won't have to tell people I have this problem. Don't do that. You want people to just report out what's going on, um, let people know if a, if a problem occurred, and then everybody can think about it, try to react, maybe have a plan to d deal with any of those situations. Um, but I think the important thing is to know the entire team is working together to get this thing to premiere. Michael? Yeah, I, I, I love where this is going. I, I think, you know, using the theater analogy, um, you know, if on premiere night you, 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 you performed and you realized that one of the main actors flubbed up his lines and one of the supporting actors forgot a prop and lighting was a little bit off and the sound wasn't there, guess what you don't do? You don't just shut down the whole production, right? You regroup and you take care of it for the next night. And a lot of times I think Go Live can kind of feel like that. You're going to get 75, 80, 90 percent of what you were looking for in that Go Live process, but you're also going to find a couple things, and you probably will for, for a little while after you go live, that you want to get better or you want to be better at or you just didn't get right. And that's okay. When you've got the right partner, they're going to work with you and they're going to adjust to that. Um, I'm a big believer, Doug alluded to this earlier, about defining success on various integrations. Define success for your project. Um, the very first L AMS deployment I ever did 15 years ago, I remember we were in month eight or nine, and, and our IT director was all upset because the CEO kept saying, well, when is this going to be done? When is this going to be done? And he was flummoxed because it, it kept getting added to. There was all these pieces. And I finally said to the CEO, well, what is done? Well, that we're enrolling members, we're, we're charging members, we're renewing members. Well, all of that had been up and live for three months. And we said, well, we're already doing all that. And she's like, great. She didn't care about the rest of it. That impacted the staff. But for her, that's what Go Live Success was. So she could tell the board, hey, we're running our membership through the new system. Now, we still have a lot of work we did after that, but that's okay. Because some of these projects do take on multiple phases. And that really does tie into kind of the last point about having the long game in mind. Um, when you pick the right partner, you're going to pick somebody that is really committed to your success, and not only your success, but the industry. Um, one of the things I love about our space is um, folks that are really, really into what associations and credentialing organizations do and, and how they make the world a better place are really committed to that business. They could be doing healthcare, they could be doing energy, they could be doing other things, but this is where they want to be a lot like the rest of you. And so, you know, keep that long game in mind. Sometimes you make some trade-offs and you decide, you know what, we that integration was going to be more than we thought, but we really need it. So can we take some of the other functionality that we don't really, really need right now, and can we wait and do that next year, or can we do that later? And your partners will work with you through all of that. So not looking at the implementation as we have to have everything done overnight by a particular point, but really having that long game in mind that you're going to be investing in your digital backbone forever from now on this is what we do as businesses so that long game is really important having the right partner with that Doug any any closing thoughts associated with that um yeah I think the important thing with this long game concept to me is that um, just because you completed the project and went live typically you're not done and being IT there are just going to be ongoing changes that you have to expect and so um, sometimes management will will say, well, aren't we done with this? And really, there should be more of an expectation that it's a living, breathing thing and that there will be changes. And you want to encourage those things so that you keep your system up to date and, and are, uh, address the business needs as you go along. So I think it's important to know that those things that you put on the back burner or that you said, well, we're going to have to put that into a phase two, that they're immediately going to come up after you go live. And those are the next things to address and accomplish and, and not think that, oh, the project's done. Excellent. So we really appreciate everybody's time. Arj, I think we've wrapped up, you know, what, what, what Doug and I came up with talking points. We're happy to take some questions or your guidance from here about where you want to go. Yeah, well, we had a few questions, uh, not many at all, but um, we have a good, good amount of time left, so let's at least try to dig into some of these if it's okay. Um, and we've got a question from Kim. It says, uh, what are some common issues to expect right after you go live? I think you started to touch a little bit on that, uh, Michael, but I don't know if there are such a thing with the common issues. Uh, maybe just something let me that... tell you. Let me give yeah. one story that I was 
kind of holding back on. Um, we did have one issue with one of our customers. Um, somebody on the project team from the customer actually created a report, and one of the reports was an invoice report. And we were so excited to get those first invoices out the door with the new system, and everything went smoothly. We sent them out to everybody, um, but we actually did a, a limited list. I think just like a hundred uh, members got invoices. And interestingly enough, on the on the invoice at the top there was the phone number to call if you had an issue, but also in the footer we had the phone number there too, and he had he had typoed the phone number in the footer, and sadly yet very hilariously, um, that phone number went to a sex line, a one eight hundred sex type of line, and uh, it was so embarrassing. Fortunately, the hundred people we had sent it to. We're very understanding about it, and, and half of them didn't realize that it had occurred. But um, you just never know what's going to happen, and you have to be prepared for the unexpected like that. Yeah, I, I like being prepared, Arge, for the unexpected. Uh, the very first uh, website deployment we ever did, we were so excited. We got it up. We got it running. And then 24 hours after we got it up, the president of the board sent me an email saying, hey, how come I can't search for anything on the website? Well, going back to assumptions, we hadn't specified, hey, we need to make sure we have search capability, so our vendor never added it. None of us ever thought about it because we just thought it would be there. Um, and, you know, the, the way to approach that, uh, Kim, I think, and I think Doug would say this, is you're going to need to be prepared for a punch list, kind of like when you get your house turned over to you after your kitchen remodel. You're going to start using it, and no matter what you've done, no matter how many tests you've thought of, how many uh, ways that you thought about pushing the system and making sure you wanted to do, it won't be until week two or three that you're going to stumble across some things and you're like, oh, look, we forgot that or we overlooked this. You get your punch list, you get it on the radar, you get it fixed, you get it taken care of. Um, no matter what you do, there will be those little oversights that come up. So I can't say there's any common thing that I see. I think it's being prepared for. We're going to have to have a break and in period with a punch list for a while until we make sure that we've run it through all of the a a um, permutations that we can think of the system might do and see what we can uncover. Yeah, I think the common thing is more psychological than anything else that your staff just <laughs> Un, you know, unprepared to use the new system. They haven't used it on a daily basis for seven years like the previous system. And, um, you know, they're just uncomfortable with some of the things that they have to do every day. And, and no matter how much training and how much practice you put in, there's going to be situations where staff needs to have someone there to, to help them out. And oftentimes, actually, I've been, I've been on site for a, a week or two after a project was completed just to be around in case questions came up. And, I think that kind of support is something you should expect to, to provide to your staff to make it smooth even after you have gone live. Yeah. Great. And uh, so I've got two more questions here if we can squeeze them in. Uh, next question is, how often should you expect to meet with your vendor? Now, I'm sure that can probably vary from different types of projects and different types of systems being implemented, but do you all have any thoughts on that? Well, I can I can talk from our perspective and then let Doug chime in on what he's seen. Yes, it does vary. Um, I think it varies on where you're at in the life cycle of the project. I think it also varies on the complexity of the project. And also, how many players do you have that need to be involved with that? And, you know, when, when, we're, when I'm thinking meeting here, I'm going to talk about this from a project management perspective. In addition to project management meetings, you might actually have configuration meetings or other meetings of some of the, the staff. But from an oversight and governance standpoint, um, I recommend at the very beginning that the uh, project management team from the vendor and the client are meeting at least every other week. As the work picks up, maybe go to weekly, make those meetings productive. What's our scorecard? What are we measuring against? How do we know we're making progress? And then I'm a big fan of a written summary that goes to everybody in the leadership on both sides, vendor and customer. And if necessary, a monthly meeting to talk through, okay, are there any major points, especially as you get closer to go live, maybe those few months coming into go live, does that executive group need to get together? What, what are our biggest risk points? What, what, what are our concerns? How do we know we're measuring and moving forward with success? So that's kind of the cadence that I recommend um, you know, as it goes. Sometimes we end up meeting more frequently. Um, putting a lot of people together is time consuming, obviously, for both groups, but sometimes that's warranted. Doug, what are your thoughts? Um, I think also the, the variance can be because of a vendor you haven't worked with before. So what I encourage mm -hmm. with, when we have a new customer is that we meet very often at the beginning. I want to have a good working rapport 
I want them to know, you know, how we react to things, how we are very responsive, how uh, how to communicate. And so I would like to do that as much as I can up front. So oftentimes with a, a new customer, I might meet a couple times a week for the first couple of weeks so that we establish that rapport. Um, and then afterwards, then, um, like Michael was saying, it really depends on the project. But typically once a week, um, some projects, it's once a day. It's a 15-minute stand-up at the beginning of the day to make sure that everybody knows what they're accomplishing that day. Um, a lot of times that might be implemented later in the project when you just really want to push through a challenging part of the project and make sure that progress is being made on a daily basis. So um, really the, the idea is that you and your vendors are partners and that you can all agree upon things that make sense and, and one of those things is how often to meet and what's the purpose of the meeting. Well, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you both, Doug, Michael. Thank you for preparing and for presenting sure. today. It's, it's always a, a great conversation to have when it comes to implementation. I'd like to urge everyone in the audience, um, please stay with us if you are seeking that CAE credit. I just have to ask you a quick poll question. Um, but. Also, I want to encourage you to reach out to Doug. Uh, their information is here up on the screen, um, or Michael. And if there's, of course, anything that you'd like to reach out to me for, please do so. If you have any suggestions also on just how to make these knowledge webinars better than what they are, uh, we'd love to hear from you um, as we are trying to bring some really good content too. So if you have any ideas or uh, suggestions, or if you've even presented on some, a topic yourself and would like to participate, we do a call for presentations. So, I uh, would love to at least consider it.